Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we have our old friend, Mr. Rob Cook on. Rob, welcome back to the podcast. Hey. Good to have you here. Um, I saw you at the Chicago show in May, which I don't think we've talked since then. Uh, that was awesome. That was a huge, I would call it a huge success. Would, would you, how, how do you feel about things? Yeah, yeah, it's coming back. Uh, the, the numbers are all uh, looking real good. Uh, we, we moved the clinic area over to a separate building, and that was probably a misstep. I was trying to go back to the big format clinics with the stage and, and so on, but in it, being in a separate building and having to trudge over there and stuff, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to do that. We'll probably just do it upstairs again and make it a little bit smaller format. But overall, the attendance and the number of exhibitors there and everything uh, was, was good. Uh, a lot of people weren't quite ready to come back in 2021 or two, but um, you know, COVID's still out there. It's still a factor, and, yeah. and some people are still factoring that in. But it's it's a lot less. Uh, so there there was a lot of excitement. Last year was the first year I think that a lot of the foreign buyers were back. There were there were okay. the Japanese were there and so on, and that that makes a lot of exhibitors happy. So there, yeah, business was booming. It was it was an encouraging year. Yeah, I had an awesome. I mean, I, I I'm there more just to see people and talk about the mm -hmm. podcast and talk to some people about advertising because everyone can do different things there. You can sell, you can buy, you can network, you can just hang out, you can do whatever mm -hmm. you want. And that's uh, the best part about it. And I, yeah. like I said, I had a great time. The, the, the community was talking, you know, the, the word on the street, because I'm sure you, you were doing a lot of different things as you kind of, as, as you run the show, uh, everyone mm -hmm. was very happy. So, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, I should mention for people who haven't uh, listened to a Rob Cook episode before or read one of your books, Rob um, publishes many great drum books, writes many great drum books through rebeats.com. Uh, he runs the Chicago Drum Show. Uh, you've been on the podcast about six times so far, which you've got so many great topics, uh, which I'll link all the, your episodes in the description and maybe I'll read them mm -hmm. off at the end so people can say, hey, wow, that mm -hmm. guy knows his stuff. Let me listen to his other ones which I highly recommend. But um, today we're talking more broad about calfskin heads, which you've got a super mm -hmm. cool page um, on your uh, rebeats.com website. You've sold them in the past. You've done a lot of stuff with them. But uh, Rob, as I mentioned before we started, let's assume people don't know anything about calfskin heads and just kind of mm -hmm. jump in and really learn the full story of, of what mm -hmm. calfskin heads are and, and all that good stuff. Sure, sure. And well... Although we're, we're referring to them as calfskin heads, we should mention that, you know, there a lot of other animals have been used sure. and and in the drum world, uh, especially uh, there are a lot of goat skin, there's a little bit of sheep skin, there's even some kangaroo, there's a guy in Australia doing kangaroo heads and, Steel. and yeah. so on. Of course, the Native Americans are are still using a lot of uh, elk for tribal drums and so on. Deer skin, not so much. It's it's too stretchy, and mm -hmm. I think human skin also would be a little bit too stretchy. <laughs> At one point, yeah, good to I, know. <laughs> I I thought, well, all these great tattoos. Maybe some of these people would like to have their skin preserved after they're gone and and stretched and you know put on drum heads, but. Then I realized, or, or someone called to my attention, that technically that's illegal. Uh, you're, you're <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just but, don't go down that road. Uh, Stick with yeah, the uh, animal yeah. skin. <laughs> but there's a there's a lot of different skin. But we'll we'll refer to it basically as calf skin. That's what most of the skin heads were uh, from, and and we we tend to think, you know, of course, drums are go back through the ages, but we're, we kind of think in terms of revolutionary war drums and civil war drums and then on up through the drums of today and you've done a couple of uh mylar head episodes uh, i think with herbie from uh remo yep. and so on so and uh i believe evans was in there at one point so uh, a, a lot of people the, even the younger guys uh, realize that heads haven't always been made out of mylar or, or uh, plastic uh so they were made out of skin before that, and generally calf skin. Um, so where to start? This is a broad topic. Um, actually, let's jump in with Rogers. That leaps to mind because uh, 
Joseph Rogers got his start uh, in Ireland working in the vellum and parchment yards. And so he, that was his skill set when he immigrated, and that's what he started doing in the, in, in the Americas, in uh, North America. And since he was, had experience with it and a skill set, he made really good quality heads compared to maybe somebody that had just, you know, uh, butchered a calf recently and was making making their own because uh, you've got to scrape it in just the right way, get it thin, get the hair shaved off, stretch it uh, and dry it and, and so on. And it, it was, really was an art form. Uh, and actually, there's still a a company in Ireland called Vellum and Parchment Works in in uh, Selbridge. I, I they're known as one of the uh, highest quality heads out there. Mm. Uh, a lot of the symphonic guys and so on uh, use them, but uh, it, it it's, hasn't been all for drums. Uh, when they say vellum and parchment. Uh, those are both kind of the same thing. They're both skin heads. In general, uh, parchment is more highly finished and was produced for writing. Uh, all these old uh, illuminated uh, manuscripts that were done by hand in the uh, 1300s, 1400s, and so on, they, they obviously needed uh, something closer to paper than rawhide to to yeah. write on uh yeah. so uh and and they still use it in those applications today not so much for books but for proclamations and and historical uh, uh reconstructions of uh, uh documents and so on um, and just to clarify that uh, you're saying vellum which is v-e-l-l-u-m and mm -hmm. it's just google quickly says Vellum is prepared animal skin or membrane, typically used as writing material. It is distinguished from parchment when it is made from calf skin rather than made from other animals or having uh, a higher quality when it is not. So mm. vellum, it sounds like it's just super thin calf skin that can be used to write yeah. on. Or, yeah, you know. I, got, I just looked that up yesterday and I got slightly different definitions. One said the difference is vellum shows the veins and is okay. a little bit rougher parchment is more finished but um, gotcha. uh so take take your pick but but it's all the the starts with the same stuff the skin yeah. and and scraping it down and so on so joseph rogers uh transferred his skill set to this continent and for decades was was known as the premier uh, skin and uh, one of the things uh, that, that comes to mind I might be taking it out of sequence is that he always uh, claimed that there were no chemicals now uh, what makes a, a, a skin head white they call it breaking white because it's translucent by nature when they've gone through the first few stages of the, the I guess it's basically tanning, but then they stretch it uh, real tight on a frame and either leave it out in the sun or in a specially heated room. And as the skin dries, it stretches and the little fibers in it break and it mm -hmm. goes from translucent to white. Gotcha. Uh, there are some manufacturers who uh, have reacted to market pressures of people who want a perfect looking head and would would use chemicals to bleach them white and so on but those would damage the fibers and wouldn't sound quite as good as a, a skin that had not been chemically treated hmm. so uh, Rogers at various times made a point of saying no chemicals were used in the production of our heads let me ask you though, so, and I think I've mentioned this in one of the uh, previous head episodes, and there is one with Jeff Stern, um, mm -hmm. uh, where he talked about, that one is called A Look at Animal Skin Drum Heads with Jeff Stern, which was uh, pretty specific uh, though to, uh, he, did, he owns the Stern Tanning Co, and it's kind of more mm -hmm. based, if I remember correctly, around the process and stuff like that, but I know that mm -hmm. like urine and like 
feces would be used historically for a lot of things. But I know that, like, uh, maybe it's more like when they were making, like, d not exactly drum heads, but, like, I know that that chemical uh, that would be found in people's pee and stuff like that uh, mm -hmm. could be used in tanneries. And I know it would smell terrible, and it was a job that people didn't really want. Um, so I know there's something there mm. where... <laughs> I don't know the details. I don't I they either, would, and I, I haven't that. seen that. But what comes to mind is there was always a rumor that the British drummers in the back in the day when when everybody was playing really hard, they said the the British secret was soaking hands in urine to toughen oh, wow. up the skin to get huh. ready for a big tour. Uh, so, so they didn't I, plaster. But I mean, I know that there was. I was. Just, there's a cool show I've watched. And I've talked about it before, but they talked a lot about how in medieval times urine was used for all kinds of things. And I know there was a job where an old woman who would be like she'd have no job or money like a in that point she was probably 50 but you know what i mean in medieval mm -hmm. times you're like it's like being 100 she would yeah. walk over bent over all day cleaning up animal poop and take it to the tannery and get like wow. a, a penny and that would be her huh. job would be to take it there and they use the chemicals to do something but they were also making like all kind not just drum heads but different mm -hmm. uses for it but yeah. anyway there's yeah. something there but that doesn't might not apply here yeah. Um, speaking of uh, Jeff, and I, he may have gone through it in his episode, but I would encourage people to go back and listen to Jeff because he's got hands on and, and doing it. And uh, yeah. and I, I think rather than drumhead specifically, he already had his, the stern tanning was already a business before they got into drumheads in a big way. But uh, the guy that I used to buy uh, calf heads from when I first uh, got into business was Stephen Polanski at uh, United Rawhide. Hmm. And uh, that's how Jeff got into it. it when P Mr. Polanski retired, he sold his business to Jeff. Yeah. And so uh, Jeff has kind of a time honored uh, tradition because at one time, uh, Polanski was making OEM heads for virtually all the manufacturers. Uh, you go back further, and Slingerland and Ludwig uh, had their own tanneries. Uh, they would just buy the, the raw skins, hustle them over to their uh, tanning facility and process them there. But eventually, there were fewer and fewer of them that were doing that. And there was like uh, Werkel, White Eagle Rawhide, and United Rawhide, and they were providing the the skinheads for Gretsch and Slingerland and uh, Rogers even uh, because right. Rogers had when by the time they became an actual drum company they weren't so much of a drum head <laughs> producer yeah. anymore. Uh, so uh, Mr. Polanski uh, passed on a lot of those original tools and uh, processes and everything to Jeff. So if a purist is really trying to get something restored to sound and look like it did in the uh, 40s when it was produced, they, you know, they might want to consider Jeff's uh, uh, skins. And, Definitely, uh, yeah. Let's jump to when I first started uh, messing with calfskin heads and trying to uh, do something with them myself and go through the processes of mounting them. Good. and. And, yeah. and so on. Um, I uh, had a music store, Cook's Music, and that uh, Rebeats was kind of an outgrowth of that. And uh, so I, I had uh, customer lists and a customer base. Uh, so when I started finding out about calfskin heads and that it was possible to actually produce them yourself and, and or to buy them and resell them, I got into that. As a lot of my uh, customers that were into drum history and, and were serious percussionists already knew a, a lot of those things, but they were also looking for a place to buy them. And, yeah. and even some of the newer drummers, I remember one of my good customers for a long time was uh, Bernie Dressel. And he was uh, uh, using calfskin heads. <laughs> and uh, the, the reason I laugh is he found out at one point that Mr. Polanski had uh, a more expensive head other than the standard white head and it was a uh, translucent and it was uh, more expensive uh, 
I guess it was harder to produce. Uh, and Bernie uh, assumed that being more expensive, it was going to be better, and he wanted the best. And they are more resonant uh, when they're in that translucent state before they're, they break white. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, he ordered some of the, the translucent heads. I can't remember what they were called at that point. But uh, then it, the first time he used them, he was on a TV show and put a stick right through. So they, he found out they were Jeez. a little bit more more fragile and and uh, more money doesn't necessarily mean more more durable. Yeah. And it, although it did probably sound a little better at, at lower volume and uh, it kind of brings us to durability. Sure. This is kind of a shotgun approach. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a general topics, talk. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the I had a an old calfskin head that I put on a Superphonic once, and I really liked the sound. And I played it for. I, I mean, I wasn't gigging out, but I I played quite a bit just for fun. And the head was already like forty or fifty years old when I put it on the drum. And I never worried about uh, breaking it. Like plastic, if they're played correctly, you know, they're, they're tough and yeah. <laughs> last for decades. Now, like any head, if you hit it with something sharp or lay it down on something sharp or you come at it with a bad angle and too much, I mean, yeah. the laws of nature take over. You can only push a drum head down so far yeah. and any, far, any force to try to push it further is going to cause damage yeah. uh, but but they can be very tough um, well, that's yeah. that's a misconception that you hear regularly and i remember um ryan with uh, bovid drumheads telling me that people think that they're not durable or there's a reason you would they, they would break or they're not as tough as plastic but it's mm -hmm. it's generally the opposite because the i mean they will if you get an old hit drum that has one on it it will last a very, very long time. But let's talk mm -hmm. about the, like my grandpa was a drummer and um, you'd hear the horror stories of playing outside and the temperature and the, the oh, it'd be sagging and you'd have to tighten it. And uh, there's there's sometimes where you wonder if a little bit of it is like over dramatic, like, you know, remembering things like your grandpa will tell you a story and be like, oh, it was hanging off and it was like dripping what's your experience with with weather affecting the head to to a certain degree and and, and all that stuff with the climate because it's skin yeah it it definitely does and you have to pay attention uh, to the the weather the humidity the temperature effects on your drum uh to an extent, what's going through my mind is right now I have a set of uh, calfskin heads, the earth tone heads, on a 60s Ludwig kit, and uh, they're in at the Rebeats Tower. And it's climate controlled there, the, and it's the, the room, it's a 24 by 20 room, and it's pretty much airtight. I've got a, a small air conditioner for. Uh, cooling and two little wall electric units for heat and that's all I need to keep it 70 degrees year round mm -hmm. and the heads on that kit uh, stay in tune really well I, I brought one of the earth tone heads home and put on the floor time on the little DW kit in my basement and I thought things were pretty uniform down there. The temperature is always uniform down there. It's a finished basement, and I've got a dehumidifier down there. So I thought it was pretty constant. But that it's like a totally different environment than the tower. And every time I go to the basement, that one tends to loosen up. Now, I'm, I'm paying attention because if we get some hot, dry weather, which isn't uh, it's it's going to come up fairly soon now in Michigan when it's cold outside, our gas furnaces start up, and I'm going to have to pay attention because now that I've got it reefed up for maximum humidity, if it gets really dry, um, it's going to I'm going to have to start backing off. Um, yeah. Otherwise, heads, it would break because yeah, it's yeah, getting tighter split. and tighter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, one, one of my uh, favorite uh, calfskin heads, it's one of the oil painted heads, and it's on a kit that came from a relative, and uh, it had a black beauty with it and so on. But uh, for years, I had that on a shelf at my music store. Unfortunately, it was on the top shelf, and it was in kind of a storeroom, and it was a high ceilinged room. And I split the head because uh, it got so hot in there in the summertime, and I had some tension on it. I hadn't been playing it or anything, but mm. um, but yeah, you do. That, that was one of the big selling points for mylar when it was developed. There's no more constant retuning and fighting with your your head and so on. So that yeah. that is a downside of skin heads. Uh, the big upside is the tone, uh, in mm. my opinion, in the feel. I mean, there's just something about, especially a wood tip stick, although you can use nylon tip sticks, obviously, but there's something about wood on leather that is very round, mellow, earthy, powerful, um, and you can almost feel it in, in some of the old, you know, the sing, sing, sing and everything. You know that's wood on leather. Yeah. And it, it's not just the head it's the big round bearing edges they had back then and and so on but um i would encourage people to try it if they're curious and uh, not every drum is going to be a great candidate for it but uh man i'm just really having fun with that ludwig kit i mentioned although in the 60s you know plastic heads were starting to come in they and that would have come with with plastic heads new but I'm just having so much more fun with it with calfskin heads that to me, it just sounds great. Yeah. If someone were to buy, you know, they're not cheap. They're, they're mm -hmm. like artisanal kind of like now they're handcrafted and they're, they're not being pressed out by a machine as much like a Mylar head. Would you say that like a snare or a bass drum or snare and or bass drum would be a good starting point instead of doing your, cause your full kit. I mean, you're, you could spend a thousand dollars if you're doing the full drum set easily. Um, do you think that would be a good starting point? Maybe get a snare head to get get introduced to him. I almost would try a tom first because I think uh, I would go with the rack and floor toms first and bass drum. Yeah, but I think given the price and the tuning and everything, I would take my chances with. Uh, maybe get in a fiber skin or something there um, and and the snare uh, you're, you're quite often going for a, a crack that um, calfskin w will get you there in a different way than the mylar but but back to your question I as a starter I would say rack times and floor time would okay. put you in, in right in the middle of the ballpark yeah, and especially if you happen to have a fourteen-inch floor tom, then you could you could experiment a little bit. Yeah. You could put that on the snare drum and see what you think of it, and, and yeah. so on. Hopefully, uh, you don't have a twenty-inch floor tom, and then you're playing. Yeah. But maybe if you have a twenty-inch bass drum, you can float yeah. around there. Um, can I ask you another question here? That's mm -hmm. kind of come into mind. I feel like you have so much knowledge about the history of the industry that maybe this will bring something to mind. Um, Maybe we talk a little bit about the change of like the industry. And I mean, these companies, it was literally like uh, I, the first thing that comes to mind is like, um, you know, big old honking wired phones and then the cell phone comes out and those are no one uses that kind of phone anymore. Or, you know what I mean? Just a complete shift in technology. Any anything comes to mind of like what the industry was like in the mid fifties for like the manufacturers and the companies mm -hmm. and the players and all that stuff. Um, like I said, I, I think, uh, the, a lot of the companies that had their own tanneries didn't necessarily get away from the tannery because of plastic heads. They are, mm -hmm. they did that earlier and for other reasons, uh, uh, we saw upheavals in the industry. You saw uh, Leedy and Ludwig both having problems, mainly because they got into banjos. And then, of course, the stock market crash and everything. So uh, the con company ends up owning both of them. And so there goes the Leedy tannery and the Ludwig tannery. Although John Yucca, the, uh, the uh, 
the fellow who ran the the Leedy tannery for years, and there was a they had Leedy produced several different levels of uh, skin heads, and their premium heads uh, were the the yucca uh, heads because he was a, a master craftsman, and uh, he did uh, the the translucent. Uh, uh, heads for uh, especially for timpani and so on but um, I think by the 50s uh, for all those reasons a lot of the companies were relying more and more on White Eagle Rawhide and United Rawhide and uh, they they must have been going through boxcars of of raw skins because there's the uh, Jerry Ryman, is it Ryman or Ryman, the fellow that makes the books about the with the newspaper clippings? Yeah, yeah, I think it's Ryman. Yeah. He's yeah. he's been sending me those notebooks, and there's <laughs> some too. really neat stuff. There's stuff that doesn't show up in any uh, books that, when you <laughs> research it, yes. and, and it's it's led me down some really interesting rabbit holes. But uh, there have been a number of uh, references to Rogers uh, in in those clippings. And uh, one was an ad for Rogers selling off some cattle. They evidently had uh, an operational farm of some kind, probably growing their own cattle for the skins or something. But yeah. uh, they they were they posted an ad in one of those uh, classifieds for some cattle they were selling off. But uh, what what really struck me was some numbers that came up in there when they're talking about. Uh, getting an order from the military for 8,000 drum skins and so on. And I thought, oh, man, I mean, I I had been thinking in terms of what I was doing in my shop. I'd, I'd get in skins that were unmounted, and I felt like a manufacturer because <laughs> yeah. I was soaking them and tucking them on a flesh hoop and, yeah. and so on. And I thought, this is just like those guys were doing not eight thousand, and, and, it, and wow. it kind of was but when you think of somebody producing eight thousand that it, it boggles my mind to think how many guys did they have working there and and yeah. so on and and when you get a box car of of hides in you've got to do something with them and they they tended to freeze them Leedy has uh oh. pictures of the the freezer because the, the clock is ticking as soon as the animal is dead uh, and the, the hide is going to start to decompose. So you, your, your window is shrinking, uh, you, but you've got to transport them, freeze them until you're ready to actually, you know, start, start using Man. them. But, wow. And can you imagine the mess and the smell? And oh, that, God. That, <laughs> that, that's enough reason to go to plastic heads right away. <laughs> but uh, one of the, the stories that uh, one of the Leedy children, the, the uh, son, the youngest son of the founder, it was uh, U.G. Leedy, was Hollis Leedy. And he lived in Michigan. And I went up to visit him several times when I was doing the Leedy book. And uh, he, he and his brother, uh, didn't really work at the at the factory much as uh, the old man kind of made him work there as a summer job to you know instill a little discipline and so on but sure. uh, so so Hollis uh, it wasn't his choice but he was assigned to work in the uh, uh, calfskin headworks and he said the smell in there it was all he could do to to function and it was summertime and it was oh. hot and and he couldn't believe that all these guys around him were actually working and he could barely keep it together and he was oh, God. he was uh, he had brought his lunch and he was praying for lunchtime to get there so he could go out and get in a, a little bit of air but he didn't think he was going to have any appetite to actually eat Jeez. lunchtime comes and they tell him okay we're going to break for lunch and he's about to head out the door and they all just pull out their lunches and sit down where they are <laughs> and start eating. <laughs> I guess you get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> so gosh. It's... That was kind of the point of his story. He said, yeah, after a week, uh, it was a different world, but man, that first day, it just took my breath away. <laughs> yeah. It's a dead rotting animal. I mean, I've, I've had a music space that's near, I guess a like 
I guess pigs or something like a rendering plant or whatever, where yeah. whatever yeah. details of that, I've never actually looked it up, but they do something with the, the animals where on a hot day, you can smell it like half a mile away. It's disgusting. So yeah. uh, a lot of respect yeah. for people who work in that, you know, yeah. field, but yeah. we're, we're drummers. Um, as, and I'm asking you, like you were there, I mean, you must, you were, you know, probably a kid around that time. <laughs> But like, was it accepted maybe the like change in technology like pretty quickly that like, oh, this is better. And I know that's kind of come up on other episodes, but like, was it pretty quick or did it take some time? It took some time, but once people started uh, hearing Mylar heads being played and the, the, the big appeal was obviously uh, not only the the cost, but the the weatherproof, you know, being able to put them on marching drums and go outside them. And it's something people have been struggling with for a long time. They they uh, I've got ads of uh, heads that were made out of cloth that were painted with uh, varnish and and stuff to try to treat them to mm. make it tougher than than cowhide. And somebody even patented. I have somewhere an actual patent for a drum head that was touted as being weatherproof and everything. It was made out of sheet metal. <laughs> and the, wow. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I guess, uh, so you could tell what was driving the, the uh, innovation, but yeah, yeah to, the idea of, of playing a drum with a sheet metal head is uh, seems no. pretty ridiculous today. <laughs> yeah, but really, though, I've never thought of that about, of course, any industry, you kind of look back and there's wacky kind of fringe ideas, mm -hmm. but cloth that's treated and hardened in a way isn't the worst idea in the world. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, Someone now would make that and it'd be like a cool little like, because mm -hmm. I know there's like wooden drum heads that actually sound pretty cool. But um, mm. yeah, that's that's pretty wild. <laughs> people will people will try anything, you know, yeah. <laughs> the the range of skins that are out there and available now are pretty much the same as when I first started getting into calfskin heads, probably in the late 80s, something like that. And to kind of break that down a little bit, the, the kinds of skins that people are, are apt to see, uh, and I'm talking about just skins before they're mounted, uh, as some of these, you can't just go out and buy a head. What, what comes to mind first is that there's a region of uh, Pakistan called the uh, Seal Cot area, and for some reason, there are, are multiple tanneries there. It's almost... Uh, like particular to that geographic area and generations of people, but there are many companies. And uh, I, I used to get a, uh, a blurb from or advertising from them on a regular basis and it'd be different companies, but it would always be from the seal cut area of Pakistan. Hmm. Most of those were, uh, I believe sheepskin, but uh, they were in general, very low quality. They would be real stiff and not very uniform in thickness. They might, on, on a, you'd start with an 18 inch skin for a 14 inch drum. And we'll talk about tucking in a little bit and uh, putting the skin onto a wooden flesh hoop and so on. But in general, it's an 18 inch skin you want to start with for a 14 inch drum. Uh, so I, I ordered a bunch of these uh, skins because they were they were dirt cheap. They were like two or three dollars landed or something, but mm. you get what you pay for. And uh, they were not only real uneven in thickness, uh, but they had very little natural glue for some reason in them. And uh, what what you do to put that 18 inch skin on a 14 inch drum, you have a, a piece of wood that we're gonna call the flesh hoop, and you soak the skin so it's flexible, lay the, the uh, skin out on a flat surface, take your flesh hoop and center it, and then tuck uh, the head onto the flesh hoop. So you're bending the flesh hoop 
or the skin up over the flesh hoop and then back up under itself. The, the natural glue properties of the skin head, once it dries, holds it in place. Not that they can never uh, pull out and sometimes you have to, you know, retuck. You can soak them again and start over and do the same thing. But these, these uh, uh, Pakistani heads were just a real pl problem. For, you could soak them forever and they didn't get all that pliable. But they finally loosen up a little bit enough so you can kind of get them on. Long story longer, I pretty much gave up on those except for situations where somebody just only wanted to put a very limited amount of money into it because they're going to put this old drum up on the shelf and yep. they want it to look complete. Sure. But as far as uh, playing with them, and, and it was very frustrating, it would be frustrating for somebody to get started tucking with uh, one of those really rough heads because it, when you go from that to a really high quality head, it's just night and day. The, the better heads almost tuck themselves. They just slip up under there. Mm. But um, Interesting. It, it gives you an appreciation for this, the tucking skill to do one yourself. Yeah. Because the, um, you get all these little wrinkles and everything, and you, you can't tuck too much up under there, but you've got to get enough to get all the way up on the other side of the flesh hoop so that it is going to hold. And yeah. So on. Well, that's uh, that raises the question then. Like, let's say my grandpa, for example, Tom Connop, who passed away a few years ago, when he was younger, would he have tucked his own drum heads, or would typically, like, he was in New York, would he have gone to like a drum shop and they would have tucked it for him, or like when you bought them, how did how did it how did that happen? You're you know you're a young guy, you're on a jazz player in the fifty or uh, well the forties thirties. Mm -hmm. How you, did you get it done already? Or? You know, in yeah. the, uh, when Frank's Drum Shop opened in 1937, they, they took a picture and uh, then they recreated that picture, I don't know, at a 20-year anniversary. Got the mm -hmm. same people sitting in the same places and everything. But in that original picture, they, uh, there was a rack hanging there uh, and there's a bunch of cow hides hanging on it and that was their drum head display so so yeah you Crazy. could go in and just buy one of those skins and take it home yourself and uh, shave the hair off it and and so on or they were in the business of doing that so yeah. uh, it's going to cost you more to have them spend the time to prepare it but but um yeah oh white eagle rawhide and united rawhide did not just the OEM stuff, but they produced heads that were put in cardboard boxes and sold by music stores. And gotcha. yeah, so a lot of skin heads were sold uh, already uh, prepared to go right on the drum. With already tucked, already on the yeah. rim. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. Because, yeah. I mean, that's, that's a bit of uh, technical... That would be like equivalent to like buying a snare, but you have to like put the lugs on. Like it's not that hard or something, but it's mm -hmm. um, it's easier if you don't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a of a unique skill, and uh, a story that comes to mind is uh, we we haven't done a Roy Knapp episode. We'll have to do not that yet. sometime. Yeah. But he was kind of the godfather of Chicago percussion in a lot of ways. There were some other guys, Ed Strait, and and so on, but. But uh, quite often, old Chicago guys are going to talk about, you know, Uncle Roy and Roy Knapp, who had the the only uh, percussion school in the country that would accept the GI Bill. So there were a lot of GIs uh, going to learn how to play drums, and those that group included uh, Hal Blaine. But then he also taught. Uh, gosh, everybody from Gene Krupa and Louis Belson and, and on and on and on. So to uh, brag on Roy Knapp a little bit. But one of his prize students was uh, Phil Stanger. And uh, the late Phil Stanger, he just passed a few years ago. But one of the stories he used to tell me about going to study with, with uh, Roy Knapp, who at his prime didn't take just anybody. You couldn't walk in and say, I want a drum lesson or a series of lessons with, 
with Roy Knapp, he would audition you and then he would assign you to one of his teachers. Occasionally he would add someone. And I have a lot of uh, the, the papers from the, uh, the drum school and after he retired where he kept track of his students and he was so proud of them because he has lists of uh, these people and what they're doing now and, and so on. And cool. uh, he was a total uh, educator and he wanted people to understand the music. I mean, he started right out with the circle of fifths and, and music theory because he felt drummers and percussionists needed to understand the music. I mean, it, when you think about it, it, it brings you right to uh, Charlie and Ringo and all these people who weren't necessarily the fastest or the flashiest, but impeccable timing with mm -hmm. what the band that they were in was doing yeah. and so on. And that was kind of where Uncle Roy was coming from, is trying to give a, a complete music education to the percussionists that he was training. So. That, that's a long-winded introduction to what Phil was telling me. I, I never heard it from anybody else, and I've met a lot of people that studied with uh, Roy, and they always, it was a custom uh, program. He always wrote up the lessons by hand for each student because he could see where they were going, what they needed, and so on. But with Phil, every Saturday when Phil would go to uh, uh, Roy's studio, the first thing that Roy would have him do while he was teaching another lesson or, or getting things organized for the day or whatever, Phil would have to get a bucket of water and take the, the heads off of the timpani that were in the studio and relap them. He'd have to, to go, go soak the heads off of the flesh hoops, remount them and so on. And, and, and Phil made it sound like this he was in the army and this was part of his kp duty or yeah. something Jeez. and and i don't know if roy was just trying to kind of test him to see if he was going to stick with it as well as he thought he roy would as that phil was going to stick with it as well as roy thought he would yeah. if he was given the discipline and the challenge and so on yeah. but he did stick with it and it was a life skill i mean to be able to tuck ahead and and especially to do it quickly yeah. Uh, in the days when all they were using was skinheads, um, I thought that was kind of interesting. But that is I don't know why Roy didn't make other students do that. He probably did, but I never met another one besides yeah. Phil. <laughs> yeah, he's like traumatized from doing that on a big timpani <laughs> head, which you don't even think about that, really. I, that didn't pop into my head about the different applications, like a timpani and a banjo, like you mentioned earlier, but everything would be would be that i mean it's it's kind of yeah. uh it's interesting do you think that if you find a drum set now that has the original calf skin heads on it does that add a lot to the value um like a vintage kit from like let's say pre-50s like a 40s kit that has calf skin heads that are still intact just loosened up or something is that more valuable yeah. No, but it seems like it should, and maybe it will in the future when, I mean, they've already gone up from 45 or 50 when I first got into it to they're probably a 14-inch stern head is, what, 80 or 90 yeah. now. Maybe when it gets up to 300, it, it'll make a change. But, yeah, yeah you would think it, it would, but I don't, I don't think it does at this point. Okay. Make much difference. Um, and then on... Kind of in that same vein, I have a, a I got an old bass drum at a flea market that was I think it's probably a twenties. I would assume it's like a Leedy because I know Leedy like kind of white labeled a bunch of bass drums for other people. And from what I've found with the type of rod and everything, uh, the single tension thing, I think that's what it was. But the front head has split, which as you know, as it mm -hmm. does, it probably got put on something or something set on top of it. Is there any saving those old heads or patching? I think mine's too mm -hmm. far gone, but can you patch or save an old animal skin head? I think you can. And I've, and I've read of people that do. And uh, with that head that split on me, that painted head, what I did was followed the advice of, that I read somewhere. And that was to take uh, 
some nylon stocking material. There's probably not so much of that around anymore. Uh, I guess there's still pantyhose you can cut up. Or <laughs> yeah, something. yeah. But um, and uh, use that and rubber cement, and that uh, took the stress off of the where the crack was, but still retained a little bit of flexibility. Um, and I've I've heard of people gluing leather on okay. too, but I I asked that question once. Uh, I was I was at uh, Bill Ludwig's house, the chief too, Bill Ludwig too, and Bill Crowden happened to be there, and uh, both guys had had a couple of martinis, and uh, you know it got to be supper time. They they tended to have two or three martinis and loosen up before dinner, and I thought this is the golden opportunity to this question that you just asked that I've been wondering about, and I had this I had recently split this oil painted bass drum and they they laughed at me they both said that virtually the same thing they they laughed and said yeah 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 here's what you want to do uh give it a funeral and bury it <laughs> <laughs> and start over and then buy a new one from ludwig <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> wow man i would like so, to have two or three martinis with bill with the chief that sounds pretty fun <laughs> just to hang out and uh was it all drum talk at that point, or did they kind of just talk about other stuff? Uh, other stuff at the table, but uh, the chief had his a little museum in the basement, and that was part of the, the video that I did that first got me into uh, the, the vintage drum thing. Um, I, I took a cameraman there and just asked him every question I could think of, yep. and then did that with three or four other people, and then we tried to edit it into something that that made sense but he had all of his pedals and and the civil war drums and the the early black beauties the dfs drum and all that stuff all shelf by shelf so uh that's uh, in the basement where there was also a billiard table and a bar and stuff so it was kind of his uh drum cave yeah that's awesome area and then very cool um all right and then <laughs> so this is this is going to be totally out of left field. It was for me. I had a, a person, a very nice uh, older lady. I did like an interview kind of on the, the local like PBS channel here last year, two years ago, where it was like a spotlight on, you know, someone recommended me because of the podcast. And um, her name is Barbara Keller. Very, very nice woman. But she asked a question. I, I think I was, said something about, or she might have asked about animal. It came up. It came up about animal skin drum heads, and that would have obviously, I mean, she was probably in her late, she's probably in her 70s, and so it would have been a thing when she was younger, but she mm -hmm. said she was like amazed that animal skin heads were used, and said, "What? I wonder what PETA thinks of that, <laughs> and I was like, yeah. I was just like, what? <laughs> like, I don't really know what you're talking, <laughs> like, I get it, but I'm also like, but it's like, that's the history of, like, percussion forever. Uh, isn't it, I just thought that was interesting. Have you ever heard of anyone kind of questioning that in the in the industry or anything like that? No, and I'm a little surprised too that I haven't. I was thinking about that the other day, particularly with slunk. Uh, now, now traditionally, uh, the the regular white uh, calfskin head is going to go on the batter side, and in a medium thickness, a medium or heavy thickness, depending on you know the, the player's choice. But then on the bottom side, they'd use a very thin head and generally a translucent head that was made from the skin of an unborn calf. And there must have been a lot of them because slunk was a thing. I mean, yeah. and you can I think you can still order from Jeff uh, at Stern today a slunk head for. Yeah. The, the bottom side um, so yeah that's a lot of aborted uh, calves that were cut up and that's that's yeah. kind of gruesome it is or yeah. there's a lot of like I know that you know maybe they don't all make it or they're there's way they're born but but that's a lot to be producing but um, yeah it, it again and it came up about I think I mentioned that what steel was doing uh, in, in Australia with the kangaroo heads and it was just like kind of shocking for her but from what i've heard is like from a friend who lives in australia is like oh no they're everywhere like it's not like a mm -hmm. you know we go to the zoo and are amazed at kangaroos it's more of like us seeing mm -hmm. like a deer 
where it's like uh, they're yeah. everywhere. So it was a little less, uh, you know, poor little kangaroo. It's it's kind of yeah. like, but again, yeah. I see people's sensitivity to it, and I'll explain if maybe I think PETA is known internationally, but if you're listening, it's kind of the people who uh, I, I'm gonna skip looking up the acronym. It's people who are animal rights activists. So that's the question if mm-hmm. you're not familiar with who they are, but. Anyway, that, that definitely mm-hmm. caught me by surprise. I was like, I've never thought of that um, ever. But to transition away from that real quick, I've also heard, I don't know if you've heard of this, there was someone uh, who mentioned a while ago about early, early, early drum head type situation. I think they, someone mentioned a, a fish skin of some type stretched over like a turtle shell. Mm-hmm pretty interesting and fish you know you don't hear about fish skin being used very often yeah uh, well as far as a, a fish skin or a, yeah snake skins various things and i'm not even sure what this is but i believe it's a fish uh skin oh wow and it's a like a chinese violin which i got on a trip to hong kong in the uh, late 80s something like that and i presume they're still making them sure uh and there, there's no tuning it it's it's tacked so it's not like i play this thing every day and i have to be concerned about the, the tension yeah. and and you're not playing actually on the the uh the head it's uh it's missing the bridge right now yeah but uh but it resonate it would be like a resonating kind of chamber sort yeah of. yeah wow yeah. very cool so Let's go with uh, back to the my my tucking adventures. I ended up with uh, uh, getting to a point where I was I was doing uh, three or four a week, and I thought that was a a lot. But I I had a, a nice surface, a glass countertop, and a couple of plastic bins of of all the clamps and everything that I needed, and and people can kind of uh, follow this by going to a YouTube video uh, and I can actually you might have a way of putting these uh, uh, QR codes up that are in sure. the book that I sent you in PDF form because sure. uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell people they have to buy the Rebeats Calfskin Headbook to see the the YouTube videos. I in the the first version of this book, I I had actually produced a DVD, so every every book came with a disc in it and so on. Yeah. But uh, when I updated it this last year, I I put those up on YouTube uh, so that everybody can have benefit of it without having to buy the book. Yeah. But uh, one the first uh, one I would point to is my demonstration of laying up a wooden flesh hoop. Uh, go, go back to where I had the calfskin head that's been soaked so it's flexible and it's laying there on the surface. You put the flesh hoop on top of it and you, you get ready uh, uh, to tuck it. Uh, you have to make sure that you're starting with a flesh hoop that's the right size. Uh, if it's uh, too small, you're not going to be able to put it on the drum by the time you get the calfskin head. So if yeah. it's too, if the flesh hoop is tight to the shell, um, you're going to have a problem. Go a little bigger. Yeah. 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 Uh, the, and how do you know how big to go? Uh, the best thing is to, uh, what I used was cardboard, thin cardboard, like uh uh, almost like a a book cover mm-hmm. or something like that. Like, uh, not as heavy as like a cereal box, but poster uh, board kind of. Yeah, and and put that around the edge of the drum. Use strips of it and masking tape, and and uh, so you're building up a little bit of a layer around the drum. Gotcha. Then then put the flesh hoop over that. And I'm presuming you have a flesh hoop that is not been glued yet. It's open, it's just a, a round piece of wood. And you can get those from uh, uh, Cooperman, uh, the last I knew, you could get them from Cooperman. Or if you go to a woodworker and explain what you want, you want a round piece of wood that's open so you can glue it to size. So you put it over the the cardboard that you've laid up over the drum shell 
and then put a little bit of uh, glue in it and clamp it uh, uniformly, uh, clamps every four or five inches all the way around and, and let it set. Then you have a properly sized flesh hoop. The cardboard represents the amount of space that the calfskin head is eventually going to use up. Hmm. So uh, let it dry, uh, scrape off any uh, glue that's uh, uh, adhering there. You might have to take a knife and, and uh, skim a little bit of wood off the, where the joint was that you made. Uh, so now you've got the properly sized flesh hoop, put it down on the damp calf skin and start tucking. Now, if you're doing a big one, like a, a bass drum, a common problem or mistake is to tuck it like you would a 14, but by the time you get it tucked so that it it isn't sagging, then it dries, it's way too tight. Oh, uh, sure. there's, there's, no, there's no slack to establish a collar. Got it. So on anything over uh, 18 inches, I would always uh, take uh, like a cereal bowl or something that size and, and put it on the table first, then put the skin over that, then the flesh hoop and proceed to tuck that 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 uh slack that the cereal bowl gave you made sure that you had a little bit of slack because you don't want to pull it real tight while it's damp and you're tucking because then when it dries it's it's going to pull things out of shape and back to the yeah. flesh hoop again you can reuse flesh hoops often i mean very old drums depends on what that poor drum has gone through over the the decades um maybe it's been cared for in a way that the flesh hoop is in perfect condition and you can reuse it but quite often since it is wood it's going to warp and twist and you get it removed from the calfskin head and i think uh mm -hmm. this <laughs> garbage in garbage out i better set that aside and get a new flesh hoop and you can buy uh steel flesh hoops and aluminum flesh hoops then the price really starts going up um uh, and there there are people like uh carl dustman at professional percussion in uh cleveland that uh has uh steel flesh hoops made up maybe they're aluminum uh, anyhow yeah. the the metal flesh hoops are are considered desirable by the purists a lot of the orchestral guys and so on uh they're generally smaller than a wooden flesh hoop because they're stronger so it's a little bit easier to for, with the tolerances on the drum you're not using up as much of the space with wood uh, yeah sure for the flesh hoop as you are with the metal uh, but it does get expensive. It's it's expensive to have those made and to they, if you're getting them from uh, a third party, they've got the hand labor of producing them and so on. Um, the calfskin headbook does have a list of sources, both for the the skins themselves and for uh, completed heads that are all put together. Uh, Pro Drum comes to mind. I I. I think they do other things besides the stern, but of course there's stern tanning and yep. pro drum and pro percussion. Uh, probably many more that I'm I'm not thinking of right away, but it is possible to go out and in, into the marketplace and get calfskin heads or the the skins themselves or the flesh hoops and yeah go at it yourself well and, and i have the um i quickly found the youtube videos you mentioned so i'll just put them in the description oh, cool. it's an interesting process and it's just kind of cool and it's 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 you're doing it and i feel like stuff like that makes you a little bit closer to your drum set um and you know you feel more exactly. in, in touch with it and things like that so i think that's really cool um exactly you know one one that i i did just just for fun, when I was, uh, it, it was an old Pakistani 
uh, one of those kind of rough Pakistani heads. Um, but I, I needed to put a, a skin on the first drum that I ever got or in grade school. It's an old, uh, I think it's a Gretsch. It has no name on it, but um, it's, it's a kind of a, a piece that I, I don't play, but I kind of like to see it now and then, so I wanted it complete. Yeah. But, but yeah, now it's it's the old. Uh, it's my first drum with a capskin head that I tucked yep. on it. Yeah. Pretty so, special. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not one I'm going to pull off and play very often. <laughs> In fact, it's probably not even playable at the moment. Yeah. So those QR codes or the the YouTube videos are the uh, one is on the laying up of the flesh hoop to get it the right size another is tucking calfskin onto the flesh hoop and the third is uh scotty doucette the late scotty doucette a great guy and a lot of a lot of people uh collectors out there remember dealing with him on catalogs and so on for years he worked at uh, uh jack's drum shop in boston and on one of my visits there he was tucking a uh, a slunk head for the bottom side of a, a snare drum and uh, he was kind enough to let me videotape that and that's that's the third uh, YouTube video hmm. um, the, I, something that that Scotty did that was a tip that I picked up on was he used uh, baby powder. Uh, I think the the head had been soaked a little too long it was a little bit slick he needed some a way to make the the skin grab a little bit more it was it was too too slippery so he was he had baby powder at hand and was uh and using that to make it go but it was a it's an amazing thing to see somebody with a lot of experience and a talent for that uh like scotty yeah uh how quickly he did it and how polished and professional it looked when he was done it was really amazing yeah that's that's true with anything uh drum related or not it's like if if you do something like like drywall or something like for you for me to do it it takes four hours but for someone who's quick it's just it's there almost there's almost no fear of messing up because your hands are so fine-tuned to do it um which is awesome but um, well, Rob, yeah, I think this is awesome, man. I think this is a pretty cool, again, general look at, um, at calf skin, animal skin, whatever you want to call it, um, heads. So is there anything we missed? I mean, I think we've got a pretty good, yeah, a couple of things I would want to call attention sure. to one is the marketplace seems to be, seems to have exploded a little bit in the demand for painted oh, sure. calf skin painted bass drum heads and you had on the fella f- that has the museum and I Tim I Norton. Know his- yeah. Yeah. Now he referred me to two or three other guys that have massive collections of these and that they've just gotten together in the last, uh, 15, 20 years. So yeah. when I first started getting into this stuff 30 years ago, um, I, I had no idea that that would become a thing. I would have been uh, watching more carefully and picking them up because they're getting kind of expensive sure. now. But I would encourage uh, people to go back and listen to that episode. Yep. And that's something else I put in the, the new version of the Calfskin Headbook is a, a lot more color uh, reproductions of all those different oil-painted uh, heads. In fact, on the, on the cover... <laughs> the image that I use there is one of the leading uh, art- artists oh, yeah. at work. And uh, I took the liberty of colorizing. That was a black and white photo, but uh, yeah. Photoshop uh, <laughs> colorizes pretty nicely. It does. Now. You told me about that. Yeah. And I ended up actually doing it for uh, some like family photos of like my wife's grandma. And oh, it's, and isn't that something it to does. see him come alive? <laughs> yes. And it's just like two buttons. It's two clicks, which Photoshop, the, the stuff you can do now is... Uh, amazing. And I'll also yeah. refer people on that note to Jim Messina's episode, which I believe was really early on, but I think it was the history of painted drum heads. Um, yeah. So yeah. everyone can check that one out. And as well. the other thing, what was the, there was another thing. Oh, Bovid. <laughs> I, I put in a couple pages, but uh, Ryan McKay, I want to call attention to what he's doing. He's, he's a young guy. 
uh, but he's doing some remarkable stuff with calfskin heads. He's, uh, for, for one, he's doing a lot of these uh, uh, skins that have the hair still on them. Yep. And uh, you can't order a particular design, obviously, because, you know, the, it is what it is. The, the hair is what it is on, <laughs> yeah. on those heads. But it does change the, the sound. It's kind of a, a muffled thing. It, it was considered kind of a novelty for years. Um, the only ones I ever sold were people that wanted to do like uh, Elvis's uh, drummer had, had had one on, the famous uh, black and white head. But uh, some of the other stuff that Ryan is doing amazes me. He's doing some two-ply skin heads wow. and i don't get that with all the challenges i had tucking calf skin heads um i kind of figured two ply meant he was going to bond it like a pinstripe or something but i when i talked to him about that no he's actually tucking two skins and he, he doesn't need to put a uh adhesive between them or anything it's not like they're going to flap mm -hmm. because again the natural adhesive uh, that's built into the the skin when you get two of the damp skins uh, together uh, there and they dry they're going to be glued yeah together naturally uh, but he's doing some remarkable things and you can you can order a calf skin that's got a second ply of goat skin or you can do a two ply a calf skin and it, uh, it's it's going to enhance the durability remarkably. I mean, that's going to open up a whole genre of music that uh, otherwise couldn't play calf because they of of the way that they're playing. Yeah. But it, it's worth mentioning. Uh, 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 Ryan's doing some remarkable stuff. Yeah. The other guy that comes to the Chicago drum show that does uh, skin heads uh, is from Austria. The Austrian drumhead company peter and uh it's great to see these young guys i i think that i don't know the ages but i my guess is these guys are both in their 20s um so i i think the the skinhead business is alive and well and uh and being nurtured by some uh amazing people out there yeah I would agree. And I, Ryan and I have been talking. And like I mentioned before, we hung out in Chicago and we would drive from our terrible hotel to the Chicago show and, and talk about all this stuff. And um, I think it'd be cool to have Ryan on to do uh, to show his process um, basically from start to finish on like a YouTube video or something like that. I think that'd be neat. Um, but Awesome, Rob. Well, this is very cool. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. But I, I want to mention real quick before we end, uh, my friend Barry James, who recently passed away, mm -hmm. sent me this super cool picture of him uh, last year. Uh, I met him through the podcast. Barry was the last living student of George Lawrence Stone, um, which who, who was still teaching the uh, teachings of Stone. And Barry was a... Mm -hmm really a disciple of stone and was a great teacher. And lots of you guys who were listening bought his book and all that stuff. So um, Barry just passed away the same day. Well, it was the next day, same 24 hour period as Dom who recently passed away. So oh my gosh. two amazing teachers, but I just wanted to kind of give, you know, Dom was very, very well known. Barry was very well known to a lot of people, but um I just wanted to make sure Barry got his his mention and everything. And I just love having this cool picture yeah. of him. Um, and he became a great friend. We talked all the time on the phone at least once a month. Um, so uh, rest in peace to Barry, um, who, you know, there's so much history out there. I'm glad to have two interviews with him recorded just for that for that reason. It means a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I spoke to Barry at one point about maybe doing a uh, a. Uh, a different edition of his book that wouldn't require so much. Wasn't he doing it at a quick printer? Yeah, or something? he, he was. And he uh, was. It's not easy to print a book, and uh, his yeah. his good friend and student Tom Cook and his wife Elaine are going to continue to sell the book, but it takes a lot to get a book out there. And I think Amazon is an option, yeah. and with Rebeats, but. Um, who, who knows? They're going to try to still continue mm. to publish his book. So maybe there's still something oh. there. But because um, you don't want it to be like, oh, Barry has passed away. Now his book is gone. You want it to be yeah. the opposite. So um, yeah. the plan is to keep it going. Yeah, I, I enjoyed talking to him. He clearly had a passion 
for it. And man, what can you say about Dom that hasn't been said by everybody in the yes. world? But uh, he uh, original plan was to have him do a clinic at last year's show, and uh, there were his health was just unpredictable, and and uh, I didn't even get answers to the to the number of contact messages I sent, and I thought, well. I, Things aren't going so yeah. well, but then a few weeks before the show, all of a sudden he said, "Hey, I'm I'm uh, out and about, and I did just did a thing at Nam, and yeah, I'm up for the show." And and I said, "Well, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll we'll get you there." And uh, we uh, we got him in, and I I couldn't advertise a clinic slot or anything, and he wasn't playing anyhow. Yeah. But just to have him there, and and to. To have him uh, hanging with us at the registration area there, everybody that walked in when they realized who it was, their eyes light oh, yeah. up, and and literally any room that he walked into, yep. we, and and he said, "What do you want me to do?" And I said, "Well, just be dumb. Just I be mean, there. Yes, uh, I it, it, it'd be great if you could uh, come over and help MC the clinics a little bit, and maybe at the at four o'clock Sunday we do the raffle, and you can help me with that." And boom, he was there. Uh, to introduce uh, the the clinics and and all the clinicians, of course, knew him and knew of him and were hugging him and so glad to see him and yeah. and we talked about you know having him back next year, of course. But uh, man, yeah, talk talk about a legacy. Yeah, <laughs> I saw him there too. We hung out up at the symbol uh, symbol makers hangout up on the second floor, and I was talking to Dom there and. Um, so there's great episodes. I can't fill the description of this episode will be full of like 50 links. Just if anyone's ever curious, you go to my website, search or YouTube or whatever, Dom Famularo, Barry James, search those two guys and you'll find two episodes each, which has really proven to be a thing that I, over the five years of doing this, where a lot of people have uh, unfortunately passed away but you can go back and listen to them. And those two guys have particularly good episodes. Dom's episode uh, is I incredible. Not only the, the knowledge and the, the enthusiasm and passion they presented it with, but just such a nice guy. Oh, is it like Louis Belson yeah. in that you never heard him say a negative word? You could, and, and if anybody were, I imagine to throw something at him and, and, and say, but what about him? And, you know, about, and, it's very non-judgmental. Yeah. It's it, it always had a kind thing to say about everyone. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And Dom's episode was Molar, Gladstone, and Stone. That's what I was forgetting before. Uh, um, but uh, anyway, those guys are awesome. Rest in peace, Barry James, Dom Femularo. I mean, it's a big, big loss, but uh, it's fun to talk about them, and uh, we will miss them greatly. Mm -hmm. So, Rob... As usual, thank you for being here. Uh, Rob's got a ton of episodes, so if you like this one, um, check out the link in the the links in the description. I'll put his other episodes, or you can just search Rob Cook probably on YouTube or wherever, and his episodes should show up. Rob, I appreciate you being here, man. And and if there's anything special link wise you want me to um, share, we can I can put those in the description. But also, um, we'll have you back on another time, I'm sure. Roy C. Knapp, mm -hmm. and then um, we'll do that, and then we'll also do some other ones about. Maybe next year, closer to the Chicago show or whenever you have anything you want to announce, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to get the word out there for you. So um, appreciate you being cool. here, Rob. It's always a pleasure. Great. Thanks so much. I appreciate the opportunity, man. Keep up cool. the good work.